And welcome to the Gen AI fan club meeting. <laughs> what a great way to wrap up the week. Hey, uh, just kidding, of course. Uh, we are here for the Enterprise Month in Review. I have Brian Summer. How are you doing? Howdy, John. Good to see you. Even though I I was thinking I haven't seen you on any of the roadshow things in a little bit here, but I'm sure I'll see plenty of you shortly. But anyway. Well, we can partially blame blame COVID for that, I'm sure. But uh, anyhow, we are back in action. Um, if folks are picking up on a little bit of sound in the background, we weren't able to resolve that, but we decided to go ahead because it's show business and I think the audio is good enough. So we're doing our best. We have a really cool guest today, Brian. Someone who can speak directly from the customer perspective to software selection, AI, how it fits into all of that. Also, a HR software selection. This can be cool. I think uh, I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, uh, and we're talking like fresh off of a software selection decision, so uh, this should be timely and topical. Let's put it that way. Indeed, hey. I've got the slide deck up and ready to go, Brian. Uh, as usual, Brian has prepared glorious slides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the fastest on that kind of stuff. So this is our agenda today. We're going to go through the uh, cringy buzzwords and overhyped tech and some new things out there. Uh, we're going to talk, obviously, about what each of us thinks some of the underrated stories are in the enterprise space. Uh, Jeff Cunningham, not Richie Cunningham, but Jeff is going to be uh, our guest today. We'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment. We got some other little stuff here to back, you know, wrap up the back end of it all. But that's our loose agenda, very similar to past events. Sean, take us to the next slide. All right, here All right. we go. So let's let's have a look at our cringy buzzwords and overhyped tech for the month. Brian, what do you got? Well, let's start at the bottom since uh, that was going to be a build. But um, this was actually said by Mark Benioff of Salesforce, and I think Digitomica's. I want to say it was Stuart, Stuart brought, you know, caught the uh, quote. And I know you have some bitter feelings about this quote, John. Uh, so I'll go ahead and let you vent your spleen about this comment. But I love this. Hallucinations are not a feature, okay? I mean, it's a shame we actually have to state, someone has to state that and make that point kind of clear as can be. So, you know, I was going to call in Maury Povich on this one because... <laughs> <laughs> I, I want I want DNA samples on who's the parent here because I said this live publicly and actually I got better than Maury Povich. I have Thomas Webernight in the chat. Thomas, it was on your show in the last AI debate a couple months ago when I said that. So I guess Benioff was watching, which I guess we take as a compliment. Um, I, Maury Povich will render his decision. For now, the paternity of that phrase is is un, is being contested. But I will say this: I've got a new one, Brian, which is hallucinations are not a feature, but inaccuracies are a feature. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I and I, I actually, I, I'm gonna. I don't think that one's gonna pick up a whole lot of steam. But okay, no, I, I appreciate it. no, I don't think it's gonna be embraced by any marketers near you. But I've I've got a I've got a, a column coming out on Gen AI adoption in the enterprise where I go into the inaccuracy issue and and look I, when I use that word I don't mean it's a deal breaker for use cases it's just a very important part um, and now we have some guests getting in on the action early which is what we like to see Meg Bear really appreciate the Maury Povich reference thanks Meg yep we all we all got sick and hung out on the couch and watched Maury Povich when we were younger. And Mr. Parks says solutions are more like a dessert topping. Yeah. It comes with a side of wacky. John, I have the DNA results. And, and the, it's oh a 98% uh, you know, fact here, apparently. As I look at the results, you are the father. Okay. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Mark Benioff will have to settle uh, for massive market share of a major uh enterprise vendor so i, I think he's going to be okay uh hey hey brent our uh thanks thanks for welcoming us back he's he's definitely uh got our nicknames down uh bro hammer cowboy absolutely hey hey brent are you doing your show right after ours let us know so we can do a little promo for that yeah brent did a show yesterday a podcast that john was sitting in on uh that thing was a whole that was 
that was a brush fire of epic proportions. I mean, you couldn't be on that group without getting singe burns all over you on that one. Dude, I had, anyway, to, but, I had to press my BS button like four times during that show. Um, but anyhow, yeah. we we got we got to press on, Brian, because we got to get to our top picks. So I'm going to move on from the. Well, that's right. Let me just say one thing else this, real quick there on the other buzzwords. The, the top one up here, the combinatorial optimization was actually uh, not one that you or I picked up on. That's one our guest speaker uh, ran into in a sales pitch from a AI enabled HR vendor. And we'll let him tell us about what that means, combinatorial optimization. And I heard this. I heard this week uh, some of the ones in the middle. Um, in one presentation alone, I heard about citizen data scientists instead of citizen developers because, you know, uh, the power of these new tools has grown so much that now you just really need the data scientist and that's it. Yeah. Um, who needs a PhD? Who needs a PhD in statistics and advanced uh, calculus anyway? Yeah, and then uh, someone's changing key performance indicators. Now we need to talk about key value indicators. While that oh, yeah. metals of a consulting firm written all over, it. and then my favorite resume spammers. Uh, okay, uh, we'll be we're always looking for these folks. If you run into them, let us know because uh, our keyword, our buzzword generator that we produce every year uh, with the unpredictions always needs new input. So let's go, John. Our picks of the week of the month, rather. All right. So I saw this one. This was one of several. Uh, all this. Okay. Um, there have been a number of interesting articles coming out about how people not in HR are not just using new AI tools, but abusing them and getting new value out of them. Uh, this lady that wrote this article, she applied to 120 jobs in a week using a variety of different, and she calls them resume spammers. Um, I love that. I mean, she evaluated them. I mean, she's doing a public service trying to find out who would give her a job as a writer. So she used these tools to see how well they would write the job descriptions, job applications, and so forth. It's just one story, but it is really interesting to see uh, how great these tools are. And I never hear HR professionals actually talk about all the tools that go on the other side of the wall, the ones the job seekers are using. And yet you, you can't develop effective uh, processes unless you understand what the other side's using and you can't build great countermeasures accordingly. That's one. So do they accept uh, 20 offers? Anyway. No, she did not. Um, but there are, uh, anyway, so this one takes it a step further. This guy actually did, uh, used a tool that filled out job applications for him. He did 5,000, or it did 5,000 applications for him in five business days. And I spoke at an HR show last um, last week with about 700 professionals, and I threw this slide up there, and I go, okay. So how many of you have a recruiting or talent acquisition team that could handle this onslaught of uh, basic, you know, just high volume resume submission from people who may or may not be very serious about you? So there's a problem there for sure. Please tell me that he ultimately took a job at a Waffle House or an IHOP. That would really, <laughs> that would really, really be the the final thing. Be the ultimate insult. Yeah. Uh, Mar Martin says all these citizen roles trigger me, but uh, but Thomas says that uh, it's all about the democratization of everything, uh, as if workplaces were democracies. Get back to us on that, Thomas. Um, Marine says no one is auditing the candidate process. Amen. Um, well, Marine, good news. AI is on the way that's going to handle that for us, and it's going to be equitable and fair and inclusive, and it won't be discriminatory. So that's really awesome. Glad to share that news today. Uh, and Tracy says, uh, anyone think it's ironic that with resume spammers and automated rejection, no one is looking at anything. Indeed. Oh, there's the quote. There's the quote of the day right there. And you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't think anyone is looking at any kind of job seeker thinking that they're going to figure out what the authentic job seeker is. And I hate to use that word. But if we but if no one's looking at the stuff and all these tools are parting up resumes to such an absurd length, then how do you know anything about the person you're really hiring? Because the person walks in the door for the interview, 
probably will in no way resemble what you're seeing on some kind of digital paper in front of you today. Let's go to the next story. But my key headline there, you will need countermeasures. This is what I spoke to this audience about at length is you have to start thinking about what the process looks like on the other side and what technologies they are using. And you have to figure out, is my talent acquisition process even relevant anymore, let alone workable? And what are you going to do about it? Starting okay. up resumes. Meg likes that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to. I'm just going to tart up my LinkedIn profile after we're done here. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, Brian, we have oh, we have uh, we oh, have yeah, five gonna... minutes, so we got to press on here. So this one really got me reaching for the retching bucket. This guy was applauding pe- someone at his company when he mandated return to office that this person went and sold the family dog so they could go back to working. Uh, in the office. I mean, what a, and, and to be proud that somebody did this in your company, it just speaks to an incredible lack of empathy or, I don't know, just basic humanity here. I mean, this was just bad all the way around. I, I hope that these people are cursed with Zoom dogs on the rest of their Zoom meetings for the rest of their lives. They deserve it. My top stories. Uh, Okay, so Apple Eyes business is a prime market for the Apple Vision Pro. I spent some time in a recent Enterprise Hits and Misses column deconstructing this a little bit. But I do think it it is going to be interesting because Apple is going to be a very interesting test uh, for for whether or not uh, these we have the kind of adoption that 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 a lot of venture capitalists are fantasizing about. But I'm expecting no. Although I, I will say this story looks an awful lot like last last month, so I don't know what happened there. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to skip over that because it feels like last month's. Brian, where did my top stories go? That's um, all you. That's all you gave me. Um, no, no right. well, we'll sort well, that out. Or else later. we got right. or else the wrong version got loaded. Um, no, we have the right deck. I think. Uh, anyway, don't wor- don't worry about it. I'll just briefly tell you what my top stories were going to be uh, because. One of them was going to be an outside-in process story by Laura Cesare, which looked at the outside-in nature of supply chains. And if you're not following Laura's blog, I think uh, it's time to do so. She's really been writing about why supply chain has been falling short. And a lot of it has to do with not starting your supply chain management based on demand signals. I just pasted this into the chat, but just do a search for Laura Cesare and supply chain shaman and check out some of her outspoken posts. It feels like every single post that she writes is some kind of like scorching penance for her years at Gartner, where she just takes all of that data and accumulated knowledge and turns it onto worthy targets. So I think she's one of the best bloggers in the enterprise right now. So that's why I picked her. The other pick I had this month was uh, two years later. Uh, Deep Learning is still hitting a wall. This is by Gary Marcus. And basically what we need to do in the enterprise is be a lot more aware about the fact that the scientists that developed all of this technology uh, are acknowledging that basically scale is not going to be sufficient to turn what we're dealing with today with AI into actually useful cognitive systems. And there's a lot of very interesting responses to this, but Gary's done a very, very good job of documenting the problems with today's brand of AI and what needs to happen next. And he's not just a critic, by the way, he's also optimistic about general artificial intelligence was a whole different topic entirely brian shall we bring on our guest in a sec here yeah let's do it cool so um so yeah so so this guest was inspired by brian's own hands-on work and we'll get more into this but we have jeff cunningham joining the show and i think i'm going to get rid of the slides so we do have one slide for jeff so jeff welcome this is your slide so we'll get back to this in a sec how you doing I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So, um, so Jeff uh, works for a customer. He was part of an important software selection that implicated both AI and HR. And out of respect for for Jeff's uh, profession and what he does with it, he gets to disclose as many details about his company and his role as he wants to. Because the key thing we want to hear from Jeff today is is basically the hard won lessons. So, so Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you and just tell us a little bit about 
how you got into this and 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 how did AI factor into your your software valuation? Yeah, so uh, I, I worked for a professional services firm. I'm in a director of information systems there at the UHY Advisors, a public accounting firm. And uh, we were looking to uh, go through a software selection to look for a new core HR platform uh, in HRMS. And uh, so we had uh, I'd reached out to Brian and Brian assisted uh, me and, and my firm with that endeavor. Uh, and we'd worked together on putting together a comprehensive vision and set of business goals and objectives and key requirements uh, leading to a, a comprehensive request for proposal document uh, that we had sent out to a multitude of, of different uh, enterprise HR vendors. Um, and, uh, and AI was part of that. So it, it was interesting in terms of the timeline where when, we start, when I started working together with Brian, um, ChatGPT hadn't really hit quite yet at that point. Um, but as we as we were going through the process of working together, then that landed, and then it started to get really big. Um, and uh, you know, I I follow uh, you know both of of your works online on Twitter or, or X, and uh, and certainly ChatGPT you know blew up on on social media, and so then I became uh, uh, a, a user of ChatGPT and eventually adopted the uh, the, the premium version of it. And uh, you know, have come to see in firsthand that generative AI is is quite uh, quite a very useful tool. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting in terms of you know how big of a factor were things like that as part of our evaluation. It certainly was a factor, and, and in working with Brian, it was listed as part of our RFP. And certainly, then the vendors that uh, we received the responses from included their capabilities along those lines. Um, but it was, wasn't certainly the top item that we were looking at. At the time, I think it still kind of goes back to what are your key business objectives and, and goals. And, and for us, we were trying to go to a, 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 a core uh, HR platform that allowed us to move away from discrete data integrations and things of the like, um, you know, which uh, generative AI doesn't really lend itself to. So uh, while we still think it's, uh, I, I still am a, a really big believer in, in AI and generative AI in particular. Um, and we're going to be, now that we've selected a vendor um, that does have those capabilities, uh, and we're actually in the process of implementing that solution right now, um, now I'm starting to, like, as, as a new customer of, of this vendor and their platform, now I'm starting to look at their documentation as to what, what kind of fact sheets do they have on their different AI modules, what, are the, what do their fact sheets cover, um, and then using, uh, you know, uh, articles like Brian's uh, article on Diginomica from from January about all the hard questions, tough questions to ask your vendors. I thought that was uh, a really excellent article, uh, and I'm starting to evaluate my new vendors' fact sheets and the information that that they provide to customers uh, against Brian's list of questions. and And I'm I'm starting to actually go through a a new software selection on a different type of of product in a different domain. And again, using that that article to actually send directly to the vendors and get their responses um, as to how their AI stacks up. And I shared this with Brian um, prior to today, but it was it was an interesting response uh, from the vendor. Uh, you know, li like most products these days on on their website, they they tout that their product features uh, AI prominently. Uh, and when I had uh, passed Brian's article to them and asked them to you know re reflect on those questions. They came back and said, well, it's actually not really AI or machine learning. It's just more of a mathematical algorithm. Um, so yeah, I, I told Brian I had gotten a value out of his article already, and it was already kind of cutting through uh, some of the, the marketing speak as to what the product's really all about. I thought one of the most interesting, and, and I wasn't trying to hide this, but yes, uh, Jeff's firm you know, and I, enjoyed a great working relationship you know, over the last year. But one of the things that surprised me was uh, you guys came out to the big HR tech show in Vegas in October. And I know we'd had a lot of conversations leading up to then um, about why it would maybe be advantageous to get as much software as you possibly could from one HRMS vendor. And then it, in that show, it just crystallized for some of your team that, oh, wow, if we did that, then we wouldn't have to train or retrain or, you know, all these other applications um, 
on the different uh, and their data stores into all the different AI tools that are out there, we could save ourselves a lot of work. And I was like, yes, the you know, and the light bulb came on. Anyway, that was that was a good ad actually to get you guys to go to that show as part of the selection. At least that's the way it felt to me. Any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And it, it's it's always good to see the art of the possible in the HR Technology Conference uh, show and expo. I think we're really helpful in, in that regard. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you really couldn't walk around without seeing AI featured prominently in, in those booths and, and sessions. Um, but it was really helpful to get a sense of, you know, what's on the leading edge of, of HR technology, not only in, you know, the application space that can help out with business processes and yeah, you know, I, I know skills is certainly a, a big thing that's uh, uh, a hot topic in HR technology and certainly had featured at the conference, um, but also around analytics and, and how uh, AI and generative AI in terms of uh, you know asking questions of analytical tools, I thought was really cool and looking forward to seeing more of that and, and being adopted in the products that I own or, or evaluate in the future. Brian, I think you might have a video freeze issue yeah you mine's definitely just, frozen uh, you might want to try a browser refresh while i hold down the convo for a sec if we can't fix you we'll just do uh do a, a reboot without it uh hey jeff i wanted to ask you something um i'm doing a piece on generative ai projects based on a study that came out by avasant and we we had some back and forth on some of their findings one of the issues was was that Gen AI can be expensive. Um, so in, in their analysis, they did a survey of like 200 companies. Um, Gen AI applications cost can be as much as 30 to $50 per user per month. Um, and so I asked uh, Avasan if they thought this, this would impact adoption and how will vendors handle that. And, and so it was interesting to hear their response and they talked about how there are going to have to be pricing implications for all of that, right? And they, they're they optimistic, Avasant, that over time, um, those costs will go down with you know computational efficiencies and, and other kinds of things. But even these new co-pilots, for example, are increasing licensing costs and stuff like that. So when you went through your, your RFP and your AI conversations with vendors, did you, um, you know, have that discussion around different types of cost issues and, and how that would be absorbed? Or was that not a huge factor? Uh, the latter, because fortunately for the vendors that we were considering and evaluating, they weren't you know, doing any sort of arc charge or additional SKUs or, or, or other modules that we would have to procure or pay for in order to land those capabilities. Um, what, one thing that, that is interesting, um, you know, a little bit aside from the cost uh, factor is, uh, you know, the legal agreement uh, side of things. And, and even with the vendor that, that we've, uh, that we've went with, they're starting to change the way that they license or have software agreements with these, uh, with these capabilities, um, and kind of evolving it into being instead of like an addendum type of thing that uh, gets uh, evaluated and signed aside from the, the main services agreement. Um, you know, they're starting to move it more into the main agreement. So I think that's something that as, as, you know, customers are evaluating these products now, um, you know, you're certainly right to point out the, the cost factor. Um, certainly I, I was fortunate that, that it didn't need to be something we had to work through. But in terms of how you evaluate the legalities of the potential uh, purchase, uh, that, that is something that I, um, you know, I think customers going through the process now would be good to, would, would want to be thinking about that. So Brian, Brian dared me to ask about what it's like to, you know, work with him, but I'm, I'm going to save that one. Um, but, but what I do, what I do want to ask though, I, I have a little bit of firsthand experience with that also. Uh, so I, some answers there, but um, what I do want to ask you though, is why you ended up selecting the vendor you did and, and to what extent were their AI capabilities, a core part of that? Like what made you kind of ultimately go in the direction you did and, and were you happy with that choice? Yeah, I mean, well, one, I, you know, we're, we're early on uh, with the implementation. We're about two months into it. So, you know, I mean, we're, we're certainly happy at the moment, but in terms of, you know, uh, I think if you were to ask me a year or two down the road, you know, hopefully I'll have the same answer, but, uh, you know, that's, that's remains to be seen, um, although we're confident about it. Um, 
you know, I, uh, in terms of like, you know, it, it being a, you know, a big factor in our, our evaluation, again, it, it was a factor, but it wasn't the biggest factor as I was saying before. Um, the, the, one of the main reasons that we had chosen the vendor that we, we went with was their, uh, the market standing, their market standing in our industry, um, the, uh, the leading capabilities that it had in terms of uh, user experience. Um, it's uh, its ability to have uh, you know multiple modules within the same suite, cutting down on, on integrations within our landscape, um, and then its ability to integrate with uh, with systems and tools all around that suite. Um, it's uh, you know extensive business processes in it, and also uh, its ability to have capabilities outside of of HR was also a factor. Let's bring in a couple reader comments real quick, or audience comments, shall we say? Uh, Mr. Park says, uh, this trend of moving AI-based terms in the main contract is a huge trend. This year, from a procurement perspective, lots of language for legal to review. I assume that you would probably say yes to that, Jeff. Okay, I do. Yeah, yeah and uh, it's, uh, I agree. I would suspect it's going to also trigger a bucket load of new uh, indemnification clauses and um, penalty you know, you know, discussions. I think we'll see the overall size of the agreements grow just because of that alone. Because because these AI tools, they have different kinds of risk. I mean, we've got risk not just of hallucinations, but of things like gener- spewing out profanity. Uh, you know, who needs a Tourette syndrome in their AI tool? But we know those things are happening. Or who's responsible if trolls really screw up the uh, l- the learning database and then start making and generate, you know, specious kind of results. So, yeah, we're not, I think the contracts are really going to just grow, 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 grow yeah. over time. Jason, I want to comment on your, on your post that certainly some HCM vendors require no additional SKUs or costs for generative AI features. And I would agree with you. And I would say that in my opinion, that's going to be a differentiator for those vendors. It, ultimately, whatever AI is effective for customers is going to be built into software. And I think the compute over time will go down and, and, and that won't be incredibly expensive. But for now, it is expensive. And even if you're not charging customers for it, you still have to account for that somehow. The, I, I'm, I'm not a believer that you can just take sunk cost and, and just absorb it without some kind of implication somewhere down the line. So it is an issue. Okay, so Brian, I got one more question for Jeff, but I think it would work well as sort of a closing question. So do you have anything you want to share about this software selection and what you thought were some of the highs or lows or anything to ask Jeff? I thought that the um, I thought that it got to the right answer, which is always what you want it to be. Uh, I also think the timing of it was really interesting because of the changes. Uh, the most important one being, then I think we're going to have to revisit what certain processes look like in an AI-powered world. For example, what is succession planning or career planning and a few others in the HR area? I think they take on a very different look and the process looks very different to the point, I don't even think you maybe even need to buy, a, let's say, a, a, a learning, uh, learning management uh, kind of product because you can just ask a tool, you know, like, What's the next course I should be taking? And it can generate that automatically. So I, I think we've got, we've got a lot of vendors who are building AI little applet things on the periphery of apps. And we need to take a moment and really rethink what the process looks like. And do we need an application to, to look and operate the way it used to? That would be my thought. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you on the on the process piece in terms of whether these you know tools change radically or or not the way that processes look like. I, I'll, I'll go back to the skills topic I mentioned earlier, and um, you know certainly from um, from like say like an operational resource scheduling perspective, um, you know skills are important. Again, working in a professional services firm, that's that's important. Uh, the challenge has always been trying to get employees to update their skills and, and keep that repository correct so that when folks on the operations side are trying to use that information as, as part of scheduling that they're getting good information put into it. And again, Ryan referencing the HR technology conference, certainly what I saw are a number of vendors that are trying to speak to that challenge of how do you use AI to automatically identify skills. And as a customer, it's going to be interesting to see whether those tools are effective at achieving that kind of automation 
um, if if it is helpful and is and if it is effective, it's it's certainly going to be extremely valuable. So uh, again, I think Brian's spot on in terms of these tools affecting processes, like whether they reshape them or or, or make them obsolete and you know not needed. I think you all hit on a really important point because that that lovely ability to say what course do I need to take next is totally dependent on accurate, dynamically updated data within the skills uh, matrix or the skills cloud or whatever you want to call it. And uh, and that's that that type of thing. Can AI maintain that? That that'll be wonderful, auto magical. I, I don't buy it. I think I you know some companies are going to have very specific skills. You're going to have to design those systems in such a way that they're still validated by either employees or managers because skills move too fast. And I just I don't think these systems are going to be able to solve that. They might be able to help though. And and wouldn't that be cool? Because if you could actually get good advice on what to do next, I mean, how many people actually have mentors that do that for them now? Not very many people. So. You know, if you can get the system to tell you something good there, then I'm all for it. Tracy says the AI is only as good as the underlying data structure come down a major gap in the majority of clients. Having the talent frameworks that is the backbone of any career plan sounds like some professional services firms are going to be pretty busy in the coming years with those projects. Agreed. Uh, we had a really interesting question from comments here, uh, probably for both of you, really. Uh, oh, Brian's taking a break again or reboot his camera. We'll start with you, Jeff. How far is the analysis of whether an LLM is really needed a topic in selecting? There are plenty of occasions where they are not needed. So I guess Thomas is a little curious about how you evaluated the AI part. Yeah, um, and, and in fact, it might be relevant to the screenshot you had of uh, the spreadsheet that I think I had uh, provided before. And and again, you know, the, that list of questions came from Brian's article from your site in January. Um, where, you know, again, one of the, 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 the new software selection I'm, I'm, I'm about to embark on, I don't think, uh, generative AI or, or large language models will be all that relevant. Um, and, and so again, what I'd done is I'd parsed Brian's article to, you know, figure out what are the questions that are specific to generative AI, um, and if ones were more broadly applicable to any type of AI model or machine learning. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's very relevant is, is to understand what are the types of business requirements you have? How does that translate to the, the AI solutions that are out there? And uh, what are, you know, what types of evaluation questions are relevant for each? I definitely agree. Any final questions for Jeff from the audience? We still have more good discussions going on around the skills topic. And, and yeah, Meg, I tend to agree about the manager part. I mean, I, I think it'd be super interesting if employees could be empowered to define what they're good at and simply have the manager come in and validate those claims, but that's going to be an interesting trick. Uh, truly, no one is talking about this. Maureen, would you care to elaborate on one aspect of that? Unfortunately, there's a slight um, streaming delay with LinkedIn and other platforms. So when we, when we see <laughs> Tell something me about like it. that, <laughs> when we see something like that, we're like, uh, yeah, that was really cool, but what what exactly was it? So um, in the meantime, Jeff, I do have a question for, for you, which I think is one of the most fascinating things about a AI and HR, because some of the use cases are what you might call relatively like harmless in the sense of things like, for example, job description generation. Now, you know, Brian's written some criticism of how valuable that actually is. So Brian, we'll mm -hmm. get into that. Um, or, or things like, you know, auto, uh, you know, auto processing of benefits claims, things like that updating leave information. You could see how AI could play some relatively harmless roles in that. But then when you look at the EU AI, AI, AI Act, which was recently ratified, it has four levels of skill risk. And many of the core HR areas are either in the unacceptable risk or high risk areas when it comes to HR. And you're getting into some very, very potent legal topics there. So what are your thoughts about just the treacherous domain of a HR for AI, where some of the use cases are a little more neutral, but some of them are highly volatile? Yeah, I mean, like you you think about uh, talent acquisition and you know using AI potentially to evaluate you know candidates in their pipeline, and that's certainly one of those, right? So, uh, and again, I think it it goes to you know evaluating the the AI mod models of the solutions that you're considering. 
uh, for things like bias and you know understanding the the training data that was used to uh, you know to build those models. So yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, I think you know buyers need to be very educated, be be eyes wide open uh, about the, those types of solutions that they're looking at and, and procuring and, and ultimately adopting. Because, uh, like you said, they could potentially get in the hot water if they're not. So I got one for uh, Jeff here, real quick. Um, if you, when you think your company, your HR team, you're in the HR IT side, but if the HR people said we want to license an AI tool that will detect if job seekers are using generative AI to write the resumes, their cover letters, their thank you notes, their uh, even to guess what your interview questions are and generate potential interview question answers, or even take the CPA exam for them. Um, So would you recommend to your employer that they look into some tools that detect that? And if they did, uh, how comfortable would you feel that you could defend uh, a, va- a verdict from one of those tools that, yeah, this was materially enhanced by an AI tool? What do you think? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, I, the short answer is I, I'm not sure yet, but what, I, what I'm drawing upon as I think about your question is, uh, say, the, the realm of, uh, of, of schools and academia, um, you know, where students are now catching on to generative AI as, as, you know, part of, you know, doing their coursework or homework or, you know, papers and whatnot. And that is uh, in the response schools and universities are starting to turn to programs to essentially do something similar, which is to try to detect whether the students have used generative AI as part of their work. And I think they're starting to come out to be some, some potential false positives associated with those tools that uh, you know maybe incorrectly flag whether a student really did use um, you know these kinds of aids or or not, and so I, I think about that those kinds of stories as I think about your question, um, and yeah, I think there there would be certainly some risk of, of false positives, um, you know, uh, where you'd be overly flagging candidates for potentially using those aids. So yeah, certainly it's going to be tricky. There, there seems like there's going to be an arms race in this in this area in the, in the near uh, near term. And that, and I already see everybody in the the discussion group is really picking up on all this. There is an irony about it. Uh, there's no question about it that you would punish somebody for using. But on the flip side, how do you really even know what this recruit's really all about if they used all these other tools? And that may make you change your recruiting process to spend more time, not just in interviewing the person to find out what they're really all about, but maybe giving them exams to find out do they in fact really have the competency in this space. It also probably might make you guys think more about maybe we should look at the ones the ATS is discarding to see if we're letting some really good ones go, you know, fall through the cracks who didn't manipulate their materials uh, and yet could be great, you know, employees. Yes, yeah, so, to me, this is where it gets really interesting because what I want to see from these systems is to be able to do things like show me the top 10 candidates that we haven't interviewed this year. You know, like, like help me surface the things that I'm missing as opposed to just like, I I understand your point, Brian, that you're probably going to need some brute force mechanisms to deal with fraudulent submissions. But to me, the exciting part of this conversation is, can these tools lead to more inclusive hiring and, and better recruitment, not, not more myopic? Uh, Again, I'm going to hang back there and go, I'm not sure any of this new crop of technologies is going to let you know who the most authentic and the best candidates are. I think what what is happening is the value of an ATS because of generative AI is depreciating as fast as the second hand is sweeping around a clock. Uh, you know, I, I'm really having I'm really struggling to find what good an ATS can do today with everyone's gaming up or tarting up the resume to an almost equal level of, uh, you know, buzzword content. So how do you know anybody's any good or not? I mean, what wasn't that part of the value the ATS was to rank, you know, these job seekers so you knew who to interview? I don't think the ATS is viable anymore in an AI, gen AI world. It just me, but, you know, yeah, so uh, we're so we're, we're screwed. We're, I, we're screwed. I really like where we're heading today. Well, uh, we're, 
We're heading right <laughs> off the cliff. This is awesome. But where this is going into the people like Maureen and Tracy and others um, that are commenting, and, and your comments are all right on the money. I think HR, before it selects more software, needs to sit down and think about certain, uh, let's say, policies as well as, uh, and get agreement within HR. Because that's the other thing I learned when I was speaking at this conference last week. The more time went on, the more questions I kept throwing at the audience about these kind of issues, I realized they haven't been talking among themselves uh, and their companies to find out what is it we at HR believe in and how are we going to operate and behave? And have they taken the time to really think through what they want the processes to be about? And that's really uh, eye-opening because if this is happening in HR, it's going to happen in finance and other places as well and in different ways. And I just think people have to think through, like, uh, what is it we want? What are the policies we're going to have and live by? And how do we make sure that this is what we uh, incorporate into our ethos, if you will, moving forward? Yeah, and I do want to point out there was this there was a story that hit the wires. Someone in the chat might be able to surface it around a, a woman who had a traumatic experience with a supposed false positive, or at least she argues that it was. Uh, from one of these uh, newfangled systems designed to detect fraud in college applications and the trauma that she went through around that, mm-hmm. and and if if true if it's true that it's a false positive, it reads it, it's a pretty reads like a pretty despicable story. I think part of it is system design because so many of these systems, like when you look, for example, at the way loan mortgage systems are using this technology at times, it's it's the the problem is not just that the AI is making the decision; it's that it, the decision is definitive that there's no way to challenge it or overturn it. And so, a really key part of this whole design is including an accountability mechanism so that humans can have review. Not that false positives are a good thing, but I think you have to plan for that and accommodate for that to take the inhumane edge off of some of these systems. Poor Jeff is thinking, what did I walk into on this call today? Welcome, <laughs> Jeff. Yeah, welcome to our show. But, but no, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've watched your episodes before, so no, I, I certainly did have an idea. But uh, no, I mean, John, it's back to what you're saying is, you know, it's kind of the phrase human in, you know, human in the loop. Um, and I, again, I think your your site speaks to that a lot as, as well. And I think that's going to be critical to like the processes that, that you know, organizations develop going forward is... Um, uh, you know, that that humans are still part of the decision-making process. I do want to go back quickly to <clears throat> Maureen's comment. Um, there's been a lot of great comments. haven't been able to read them all. Uh, Maureen says, poor current employees who are being shouted out about doing AI when all their current data is a mess. And I think this is actually a really, really important theme because I think one of the major differences between the chat GPT form of AI and enterprise AI is that for enterprise AI to be anywhere near successful, it does require an accountability with data that's not the same on the consumer side where they basically just sucked up most of the internet and said, let's see how this goes. And and in the enterprise, the quality of the data is going to be such a major factor, which is both a challenge, but also an opportunity to finally have this long-awaited data conversation. And so I think that's really interesting. And I don't know what you guys think, but I think that if, if, if that kind of conversation is part of what this provokes, then maybe some of the hype actually is worth taking on in that case. I'll, I'll jump in on that really quick. I totally agree. I mean, so one of the things that I've recently done is hire a data architect on my team uh, for that very reason. Um, you know, what we're also looking to do uh, from a from a firm wide view is is have a reporting strategy that um, you know thinks about having these AI capabilities in, in the reporting tool set. I, I go back to the what I saw at the HR Technology Conference and what I was really enamored by with that one. Uh, analytical tool set that allowed you to ask questions of your data set. And that's what we're trying to achieve um, or, or get to with our reporting strategy uh, enterprise wide. Uh, and uh, you know what we're finding is that these these components require um, you to store your data workloads um, in, in the cloud. Uh, and then you need to have, uh, again, just good data that's being you know pulled into those environments. Uh, so uh, things like you know, data governance and data standards are, are critical and, um, you know, having the, a good handle on how clean and, and accurate and something your data is, is, I think, going to be uh, going to be absolutely essential. Tracy wants to know if anyone's nervous about a breach. Hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, these new systems do bring new attack vectors, if you will, such as prompt hacking and things like that that have to be included in your overall security strategy. Um, but I, I, I just reviewed this uh, study by Avisant, and actually cybersecurity was cited in their survey as the number one concern around generative AI. What I was trying to figure out was whether they were more concerned about outside um, hostile actors using those tools, which I think is a really big problem, uh, or or where they were worried about the insecurity of the tools themselves. Um, but obviously, all of this is part of the equation. But you know, I will say that that I don't think is unique to Gen AI at all. I mean, this is like a constant concern with any new software adoption. Is is the I assume Jeff that you probably had a nice long conversation with your security team around the solution you selected, for example. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. So I was going to say, Tracy's got a comment here about copyright litigation. One of the things that came up when I was talking to these HR folks last week was, hmm, I hadn't thought to ask all the like insurance providers and benefit providers, whatever that we have, if we actually have permission to upload all of their content into our the training of our new AI tools, hmm. and that was a that was one of those that had that, oh, you know what kind of moment for some of the folks in the audience because they hadn't thought about it. They just assumed it might be okay, but they hadn't actually paid attention to the copyright on that. And um, caveat emptor, folks, um, that stuff's everywhere. Indeed. Jeff, any final words of wisdom? Great guest appearance today. You really brought a lot to us. Uh, any final words of wisdom for customers embarking upon these types of selections? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I again, I'm looking at the comments, uh, you know, from from Tracy about transformation is not technology, and I think you know some of it is even even with all these new, you know, really exciting technologies like AI or generative AI. It's you know still comes back to the fundamentals of how you do. A really good digital transformation. Um, you know, having really great, uh, clear vision and business objectives and, and goals and, and requirements to find what your vision of your future state process needs. Um, and really great executive sponsorship of of those initiatives. Um, so, and and again, data as well as as we spoke about. So, those are all still key ingredients of any su successful selection. But now it's now you have the added. Uh, step of starting to properly evaluate uh, the AI components of the software that you're selecting, and and again, uh, you know, through sources like Brian's article and the and the articles that you provide, John, uh, it's really helpful for me and, and others in in my position to be as educated as we can uh, about evaluating these components. Well, Excellent. I'm just. Personally, I'm just thrilled that we that you didn't ask John, you didn't ask Jeff what it was like doing a project with me. So thank you for not doing that. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm saying that because I think we're running out of time here. But anyway, uh, thanks. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us today uh, on the couch. And I'm sure we'll see you again in the future. Brian and I are going to head towards the wrap. Appreciate you joining us today. That was awesome. Thanks for having thanks. me, guys. Thank you, Jeff. So, so Brian, I am. Um, I, I I deleted our slide deck for, and I can't reload it. Um, uh, uh, well. So you may you you may be able to. I I did it before by hacking in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to take on Jason's comment. Oh, you got it back. Cool. Um, so Jason says some low hanging fruit. It's funny, Jason, because I just used the low hanging fruit phrase in an article around this topic. And I apologize for using the cringe phrase, but it is it, it is like a hard phrase to get around sometimes of generating knowledge based articles to answer FAQs or the ability to enable digital assistants to digest employee handbooks or great use cases. The latter would be great for large employee populations. And yeah, Jason, I agree with that. And I think some of these AI systems are are, are pretty good at restricting their output to very specific kinds of content, which can really reduce some of the accuracy type issues that you can run into. And and I think those are like I like I was saying before some of those more quote unquote harmless. I mean, none of these you know scenarios are harmless, but some of these more harmless use cases um, you know are really I think useful to look into for for starters. And the other thing also is that some of these um, LLMs can be designed so they can pull in information from multiple documents, whereas in the past kind of those rules based you know FAQs would circulate generally one answer. 
Whereas some of these LLMs can pull properly from different areas into one coherent answer, which is really useful. Ryan, do we know which one uh, pull up there? I don't know which one. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling it to share, but it doesn't want to present it. So there. Oh, here. Oh, wait a minute. Want? Let's just go on and see. Oh yeah, and we mm -hmm. skip. We skip Jeff's graphic. Um, I was going to ask well, what, about that, but I lost the slides. Do you want to briefly explain that graphic? All that was was Jeff's already started building a, uh, a spreadsheet of all kinds of questions that he referenced out of the article that's hidden behind there. That was uh, this slide originally had a build in it. So sorry about that. But uh, if you haven't thought about creating a whole series of additional questions for future technology RFPs, RFIs, you send out vendors, you need to get moving on it. And he was referencing a piece I did on Diginomica back in January, February. Okay, next slide. Oh, oh we got a couple whiffs, yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about an AI-based whiff. This is, um, this is what you get, or at least what I get when I top, type in John Reed Diginomica. I have a long-running feud with uh, Google about this. Currently, I'm John Edward Reed. Um, I'm not total, I don't totally see the resemblance. If you if you click <laughs> if you click on this, you get you get to a headstone of a de, a dearly departed conductor named John Reed, who's no longer with us. Um, and uh, the the awesome thing too is pinging Google uh, author profile support on this, and them saying that they can't fix it with human. We talked about system design; only the AI can fix the AI. So we just have to wait and hope the AI figures it, figures it out. This someone said this is getting ridiculous. I think it was Tracy. Yeah, this world's getting kind of ridiculous. Oh yeah, and I did the old uh, McDonald's stores hit by global IT failure. Finally, a non AI whiff. Um, so, although I said if you ended up getting a better food option instead, that it wasn't a failure. That's probably pretty mean. Uh, but that was uh, one of the top whiffs of last week. Brian, now we're on to actually the feel good portion of our program. Hmm. I don't know that I have anything there. Um, anyway, um, what creates value? Boy, I've been looking at that right now. I'm up to my eyeballs in the use cases. But the one thing I, I wanted to tell people is uh, all of a sudden, ESG, which never got mentioned once today, um, I'm going to mention it now, had just been exploding in the last couple of days. And um yeah, I, I saw that. Nice pick, John. I don't know if they were talking about the one on Google or this one on this I screen. Think, <laughs> I, think the one on, I think the one on Google, but I like this one even better. So who knows? Um, I lost my thought. Anyway, you got anything that inspires or creates value, John? Uh, well, yeah, I, I do a little bit. I think I think these kinds of conversations to me are where it's at. Like, like, I don't think anyone has all the answers right now. And we're certainly going through something fairly profound, both as an industry and I think broader culturally. And I think to have these kinds of conversations with this kind of back and forth between such such a like smart, kick-ass audience like this, and then have people like Jeff to talk to, uh, to me, that's value. I hope, I hope you all feel the same way. I really appreciate that you end your week with us like this when we do this. And, uh, so I learned a lot today. So to me, that that's important. And one of the reasons it's important, just to just, just explain why I think it matters. If you heard my debate yesterday, I went on a big rant about this, but just the way in which these so-called social media walled gardens are not necessarily surfacing the best content, even though obviously I am streaming to some of them right now, but, uh, but they don't necessarily surface the best content all the time. They surface a lot of self-promotional and marketing gobbledygook. And you know what I've been saying about this is that engagement is not a proxy for quality. So don't necessarily just always take the stuff that's being spoon fed out there and, oh, this, that, this or that. There's a lot of mis inaccurate information coming out. So I think these conversations where we can really hash it out like this make us all smarter and better. So that, that, that makes me feel good. So actually to that point, John, uh, one of the things I'm, what you guys ought to know on the project I worked with Jeff on, it wasn't just me. There's another industry analyst by the name of Catherine Jones, Dr. Catherine Jones out of uh, Palm Springs. Catherine and I worked on that together. And I told Jeff and others at the, at the client that uh, there will be moments when even Catherine and I don't agree on something, but where clients tend to learn a lot is 
looking and listening to both arguments from two sides and like understanding what's going on on the two different ends of the goalpost. And that's where real insights, I think, really happen. And that's probably some of the value that comes on these kind of conversations going forward. It's okay to have different viewpoints, uh, particularly because there's probably going to be something you're going to pick up and learn from both ends. Anyway. Yes. And by the way, I think, Jeff, you're still watching backstage. Feel free to hang out. We'll we'll have a little <laughs> chat after the show is over. Uh, Mr. Park says he it's get it's good that cloud computing crypto and gen ai use so much energy so we get to pay more attention to sustainability is that how you see it brian uh i think we need to pay more attention to it um for sure by the way uh i thought where he was going to go uh mr park was going to go with this was actually um i was on a call with oracles uh one of their evps the other day I asked him point blank, what kind of questions are you getting from prospects and customers these days? And the first response was, uh, relative to AI, that is, and his first response was, well, I'm so glad I'm not getting questions like, uh, is now the time to move to the cloud or, you know, or should I be ready to go to like a multi-tenant kind of environment? He goes, I don't have to explain those kind of points anymore. He uh, goes, but to... The kinds of questions that people are asking about generative AI said, you know, generally I only get one question, which is how do I keep our company's data from getting into the uh, the, uh, private data, getting into the public tools. And that's really about it. So I think we are we are in the really, really, really early stages here. And we have a whole lot more to learn and question and press vendors on, not just analysts like us, but the uh, the buying public out there needs to be a lot more cosmopolitan about what these things are all about. No doubt. Uh, and Thomas, by the way, says uh, it is more than just okay if renowned analysts sometimes contradict each other. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure about the about the renowned part. <laughs> that, but, but I will say I've had a lot of good arguments with Thomas. So. We're, we're we're on to something. Oh. Uh, I remember. I think you were interviewing me and Esteban once at a like an SAP show. Uh, and, oh my god! That was uh, and the classic line of all time. Esteban looked right at me and he goes, "You know, Brian, uh, your facts are correct. It's your conclusion that is wrong, or something like that. Totally wrong, or whatever." That was yeah. Was. That was that was devastating because he was basically saying like. Your worldview, you understand the world, but you can't actually draw a proper conclusion from the information you have. That's like, that's pretty good, man. Be, be careful yeah. with Esteban. Be careful <laughs> with Esteban. I, he and I got into some fisticuffs yesterday, if y'all want to look up that show. So, oh my goodness. I had to use the BS button on him, actually. So, uh, which I haven't had to use today, thank, thankfully. So, uh, all right. Well, we're just about to wrap. If y'all have any final comments, make them real quick. Um, but uh, we'll we'll definitely do this again next month. And uh, I think we're starting to get into a groove, Brian. So, but pretty good. And I want to thank everybody for all the comments. There were a bucket load of them today, and very good ones too. Uh, thankfully, the trolling messages were very limited. So, thanks for that. Uh, anyway. High signal conversations for the win. Well, thanks, y'all. Have a great Friday. Thanks for joining us. Much appreciated. Catch you next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>